All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the latest set of BCBA exam practice questions where we're going to the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack and practice exams. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Janelli, a behavior analyst, is typically on top of supervision. However, the last four weeks have been busy. First, she was out of town for a week. Then she got sick and couldn't work for a week. Next, her car broke down, so she couldn't drive for a week. It's now been three weeks since she provided supervision. What is Janelli risking happening with her case? As analysts, behavior analysts, it's our duty to provide constant ongoing supervision and training for our cases. That includes technicians, parents, ensuring our clients get the best treatment possible. Now, things happen, life events happen, but we have to maintain and ensure ongoing services no matter what. The problem here is Janelli had all these issues back to back to back, which happens, but she's done nothing about it. It's been three weeks since she provided supervision. Why is that a problem? Why is it such an issue for her to miss three whole weeks without supervision? What is Janelli risking happening with her cases? A, treatment drift. Treatment drift occurs when, however Janelli wrote up the treatment plan, what might have originally been implemented correctly is now starting to drift, and treatment is starting to become shaky or less than because she isn't there overseeing it. Treatment drift is a real risk if we've gone three weeks without any supervision. So A, Looks good. Let's read all of our answer choices. B, observer drift. With observer drift, now we are measuring the wrong thing or we are taking stock of the wrong thing. We're observing what we're not supposed to be observing or we're misinterpreting what we're supposed to be observing. In other words, if Janelli has picked target behaviors and observer drift is occurring, her technicians or maybe her stakeholders are starting to observe other things. And she hasn't been there to correct that. So A and B both look good. What about C? Poor fidelity. Now treatment fidelity means in general, are we implementing treatment as prescribed? Are we doing a good job maintaining fidelity of our treatment? And treatment drift, observer drift are all threats to fidelity. Since Janelli hasn't been there for three whole weeks going on to four, there's a risk that all these things are happening. Treatment drift, observer drift, and poor fidelity. Janelli needs to make it a point to either find time to supervise as soon as possible or facilitate ongoing services by getting somebody else to fill in in the meantime. So you can't keep putting it off because the only person really getting hurt is the client, and that's who our number one priority is. Each day, every student in a third grade class gets to pick a piece of candy from a bowl at the end of the day. This candy is contingent on following the classroom rules and procedures all day. Students who do not follow the rules and procedures wear a green band around their arm, and those with the green band do not receive candy. What is this procedure specifically considered? So probably one of the more, if not the most straightforward timeout procedures, because it's it kind of is an obvious one, right? The, the name lends to itself. What's happening here? Well, students in third grade get to pick candy from a bowl end of the day. Candy is contingent on following classroom rules and procedures all day. Students who don't do that, they wear a green band around their arm, and they are unable to receive candy. They're in, they're in timeout, right? They're in timeout from the opportunity to receive the reinforcement. So what do we call that? And the green band is what's specific here. So A, exclusionary timeout. Well, with exclusionary timeout, the person or learner is removed from the environment altogether. They're not removed here, right? They're still in class, still participating. They just can't receive the candy. What about B, non-exclusionary timeout? With a non-exclusionary timeout, you're removing a reinforcer that's already there. And for, for a, a time period that you set, and you're not excluding them from the environment, you're just removing some sort of reinforcer. However, with a C, timeout ribbon with the green band, this prevents them and doesn't allow them to gain access to the reinforcer because of this ribbon, or in this case, a band. 
and then departition timeout. Well, partition timeout, you've got some sort of divider separating the learner from others. Again, not happening here. What we've done is we've taken a timeout ribbon procedure, and instead of a ribbon, we've used this green band, and those with the green band do not receive the candy. Jonas's client wanted to learn a joke that he could tell in the situations where he wanted to attempt to be funny. Jonas taught his client this joke until the client mastered the delivery. Jonas then mastered the skill and moved on. Two weeks later, Jonas asked his client to tell him the joke that he learned. What was Jonas testing for? Okay, let's think about this. What is Jonas looking for? Well, we know Jonas's client wanted to learn a joke where he could be funny. So Jonas obliged, taught his client the joke. Client mastered the delivery. Therefore, Jonas mastered the skill, moved on. And that's the key. He moved on, skills mastered, no longer teaching that joke. Now, if three weeks later, Jonas says to his client, well, tell me the joke we learned. We haven't taught him in three weeks, but Jonas says, let me hear that joke. What is Jonas testing for? A, response generalization. Well, with response generalization, Jonas would likely be looking for a different joke or a variation of that joke. It's not what he's doing here. He doesn't want to generalize the response. He wants that same joke that was learned three weeks ago. What Jonas is really testing for is maintenance. We've taught the skill. The skill has been mastered. We stopped teaching the skill. We now check to make sure that skill has maintained. Three weeks later, Jonas asked his client to tell him the joke that he learned to make sure the client maintained that joke. See overgeneralization. Well, he's not testing for overgeneralization. If Jonas asks his client to tell him the joke and his client does, that's an appropriate time and place to tell said joke. So what Jonas is really testing for is maintenance. Has the client retained the joke even though teaching has stopped? A college class is talking loudly about their weekends and their plans for the upcoming weeks. Many are watching TikToks on their phone while others are attempting to finish assignments that are due. Whenever Dr. Jefferson walks in the room, everyone looks up and stops what they are doing and focuses on Dr. Jefferson. What is on display here? Let's not overthink this one. What is on display here? We've got this college class talking loudly, watching TikToks, finishing assignments, all these different behaviors, unruly behaviors, uh, pre-class behaviors, however you want to describe them. But everybody stops when Dr. Jefferson walks in. They stop and look up. Dr. Jefferson has complete control over the classroom's behavior. So what is on display here? A, experimental control. Well, with experimental control, we need an experiment, and we're not manipulating anything here. So we don't have experimental control because we're not trying to determine if Dr. Jefferson has control. We're just being told he does because when he walks in, behavior changes. What is on display is Dr. Jefferson's stimulus control. He's got stimulus control over all these behaviors. Stimulus control occurs when there's behavior change and behavior occurs either less or more in the presence of a stimulus. Dr. Jefferson walks in, everybody's behavior changes. C, resurgence. Well, you should not pick resurgence. You shouldn't even consider it because resurgence has to do with extinction. We're not talking extinction here. And then D, discrimination. Well, discrimination is the ability to tell the difference between two or more stimuli not necessarily happening here. If anything, the kids are differentiating their responses, not necessarily discriminating stimuli. What's occurring and what is on display is stimulus control. Dr. Jefferson is, is, has stimulus control over all these college students. You're chatting with one of your client's parents following a supervision session with your technician. The parent tells you of a new skin cream they've been using that is supposed to help with symptoms of autism as well as sleep patterns. The parent tells you that they started using it after a recommendation by the behavior technician. How should you respond? Okay, kind of a, a variation of a pretty common question. Because in this case, your technician has already recommended a skin cream. It's not like they asked you for recommendations or they're thinking about it. They've already made the recommendation, which we know is a huge no-no. This is not the technician's role to make these recommendations. So as a supervisor, as a personnel manager, and keeping the best interest of the client in mind, how do you respond? 
How can you respond in this situation? A, tell the parent to stop using the cream immediately and ask the technician why she would violate the ethical code by recommending the product. So two things with A. One, you don't know anything about the skin cream. Maybe the skin cream is effective. You don't know that, right? And we don't know anything except the technician recommended it. So maybe it is actually a miracle cure. Maybe it is effective. So telling this parent to stop using the cream immediately before gathering more information, you can't do that, right? We have to be data-driven. Two, ask the technician why she would violate the ethical code by recommending the product. Well, you don't want to do that in front of the parent, right? So you're jumping to a lot of conclusions than A, you're acting too rashly. You're acting too, too impulsively. As the analyst, you've got to remain cool and calm and collected at all times. So B, fire the technician for endangering the client by recommending a product without consulting you first. Well, they made a mistake, right? They're not necessarily endangering the client. It's not like the client's being harmed, right? It just might not be helping. Now, they shouldn't be recommending the products, but firing them for endangering them isn't necessarily what happened. C, ask for the name of the product, research it, and schedule a meeting to discuss the situation with your technician. Okay, great, right? Find out what the product is, get more information on it. Maybe it's effective, maybe it isn't, maybe it's harmless. If it's harmless and the parents think it's working, let them use it, right? It's not interrupting services, it's not causing harm, no big deal. Now you do have to discuss the situation with your technician because this can't happen again. This is definitely a violation of the RBT task list and the ethics code and just the team hierarchy that we know exists in ABA. So you have to have this meeting. C looks good. D, schedule a meeting to discuss the situation with the technician, but allow the parent to continue using the product without saying anything. So the reason C is better than D is you still want to go research the product for yourself. And if you don't find anything wrong, if there's no harm to it, then maybe you don't say anything. But if you find out that maybe it isn't empirical or maybe there is harm, then you can't just allow the parent to continue using it without saying anything. That is your role as the analyst to provide that type of feedback and information. So the best recommendation here or the best response here is C, ask for the name of the product, research it, schedule a meeting to discuss the situation with your technician. While teaching a learner to identify the letter Z, a tutor makes the Z larger and a different color than the other shapes in the array. The tutor then removes the color from the Z and eventually reduces the size of the Z. What is the tutor doing? So immediately, what jumps out is this is a prompt fade, right? Because they want the learner to identify the leaner, the learner to identify the letter Z. So they make the Z larger and a different color, right? Immediately altering the stimulus, making it a stimulus prompt in the other shapes. Slowly, they take away the color, right? They remove the color from the Z, and then they reduce the size of the Z. So they've taken those stimulus modifications and one by one, remove them. What are they doing? A, stimulus transfer control. Are they transferring control, stimulus control? 100%. Prompt fading is essentially just stimulus transfer control. We need to transfer Z from this modified Z to a normal Z. That's all they're doing here by doing what? Well, prompt fading, and that's C. B, reinforcement fading. We, we haven't talked about reinforcement. We haven't discussed reinforcement. Reinforcement really has nothing to do with this situation. What the tutor is doing is stimulus transfer control via prompt fading. So our answer here is D, both A and C. Which of the following terms is characterized by a personal application of behavior change that produces a desired change in behavior? So this is a teaching question because it's kind of a definition, but I think it's an important one because when we talk about this topic, there's a lot of different terms that feel and sound the same. We're looking for the term that is the personal application of behavior change that produces the desired change in behavior. Basically, this is the umbrella term for all our other self techniques. So self-control is more or less preventing yourself from, from gaining reinforcement, okay? And it's kind of a misnomer, but that's more or less what it is. And so it's not really the personal application of behavior change that produces a desired change in behavior. B, self-monitoring and C, self-evaluation are components of this thing. And this thing is self-management. 
self-management is the application of behavior change that produces a desired change in behavior. So through self-monitoring, self-evaluation, and self-talk, and all these other techniques, we are engaging in self-management. And self-management is the personal application of behavior change that produces a desired change in behavior. Thank you for watching. Be sure to check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all our study materials. Let us know what you, when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout-out. Subscribe for all of our updates. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.